Hi. How's it going? Awesome. My name is Isaiah Stoddart. I'm the youth pastor here, and I get to preach today. If you haven't met me, welcome to Freedom Valley. Nice to have you here today. So there's a lot going on here today for me. Um, I'm going to make it all about myself. I'm Father's now. Um, but I, I have a lot of people that I would like to honor, a lot of people that I'd like to address today. So before I start jumping in to the message, uh, first off, happy Father's Day, guys. Obviously, I've been saying happy Father's Day, but I want all the fathers to stand. If you can stand, let's honor the fathers in here and give them a hand as they stand up. Awesome. And all the fathers joining us online, happy Father's Day, guys. Bringing people into the world is important. And uh, from what I hear, apparently it's like difficult or something to be a dad. So good job. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. You guys can sit down. Uh, many of you know my dad, Lance Stoddart, uh, used to pastor here. Uh, I'm not sure if he's watching live right now, but I know he will be watching this sometime. So Happy Father's Day, Dad. Uh, sorry I don't get to, you know, spend it with you. He's over in Pittsburgh. But, you know, we'll see each other, and we'll celebrate then. Uh, and also, I got my stepdad here today. His name's Ron. Happy Father's Day, Ron, as well. And uh, my best friend, Lane, uh, Lane Rice, he's a pastor at Mana Church down in Virginia. He's celebrating his first Father's Day. Um, I'm not sure if he'll be watching this ever. But, Lane, if you do happen to watch this, happy Father's Day, man. I am so happy for you. Congratulations. Um, today is also my wife's birthday. She's not here. She usually comes second service because she likes to sleep. And we're going to sing happy birthday to her later. She's going to hate it and it's going to be awesome. All right. But I know she's probably listening because she's getting ready. Happy birthday, wife. I love you. Oh. <laughs> uh, and I have one more person. All right. I have one more person. I told you. I have a lot of things going on today. I have one more person I want to honor today. Um, I'd like to dedicate today's sermon especially to my friend Eric Sterner. Many of you guys know uh, of his passing uh, a few weeks ago. And, um, but the idea of this sermon came from him. Uh, since February, the youth group has been going through the book of Luke chapter by chapter every single week. Uh, many of them have never read through any of the Gospels before, so I started this series to remedy that, and we've been going through it every week. About a month ago, we were in Luke 9, and I gave a message from there. Afterwards, uh, me and Candace and Eric, we were talking, and uh, Eric said, of course he said, he said, hey, Candace. The message Isaiah gave tonight, would I think, would be really beneficial for the whole church. And to which I naturally said, <laughs> no, <laughs> don't tell her that. I'm already preaching next month, and that's plenty. This summer's crazy, all right? Not that I don't like preaching on Sundays with you all. I do. But Sunday sermons take a lot more time and a lot more pressure to write just mentally just like youth, I can come in, I can chill, and if I, you know, if I screw up, you know, it's my ministry. I'm just like, you know, get over it, you know. <laughs> On here, you know, I'm representing Candace, I'm here for everyone, so it's a lot more stressful. But when I was thinking last week about what I was going to uh, preach for this sermon, um, the, that conversation came to my mind with Candace, Eric, and, uh, yeah, with Candace and Eric. And uh, I thought about it, and I realized that that message would go perfectly with the Gospel Boot Camp series. And so, Sterner, you got what you wanted. Um, tonight, today, Luke 9 is in my message. It started from that, but it grew into a much larger message. And so, yeah. Uh, today, it's for Sterner. And he wanted you guys to hear this. So, whew, let's get into it. So far in this series, we've learned two things. Being born again isn't optional. That was week one from Candace's message. And then, well, isn't optional to see the kingdom. And then last week, we learned that we all have a story to tell. Well, the thing about having a story to tell is... 
Just because you have a story that's worth telling doesn't mean you're actually going to tell it. Right? How many understand that? Who in here has a story to tell? Let me see your hands. All right. All right. That's not everyone's hands. Uh, if you're a believer, you have a story to tell. Every single person in here who believes in Jesus should have their hand raised next time when I ask for it, which is coming. <laughs> if you're a believer that, and you don't think that you have a story to tell, you need to take some time and examine your life. What has God done in your life? How have you changed since coming to know Jesus? We shouldn't be the same as we were, so what's changed? And once you figure that out, there's your story. How were you? Jesus came, he changed, and now I'm like this. You're, that's your story. And if you feel like you're still having a hard time finding out your story, well, guess what, guys? We have the gospel. That's our number one story anyways. All of us, all of us who believe, we have a story. Even if you feel like you don't have a story, even after you examine your life and you're like, well, I'm not sure if I'm different. And if you aren't different, then that's something to be concerned about. But we also have the gospel. And it's not really also because the gospel is our number one story. Isaiah 55, 11 says that God's word always produces fruit. It will accomplish all God wants it to, and it will prosper everywhere he sends it. That's not a promise for our testimony. God will use our testimonies. Don't get me wrong. But this promise from, I, I, I didn't put it in the computer, so it's not up there. But this promise from Isaiah 55, 11 is for God's word, is for the gospel. The gospel will produce fruit. Your testimony might not connect with the person you're talking to, but the gospel will do what God wants it to do. That is our story at the least. <clears throat> it's good news. And I have some good news. The gospel's already written. All you have to do is learn it. You have to learn it, and then you can recite it, and then you can just tell it's the same story. You can tell the same story to plenty of different people. All right? You don't have to get creative with it. Tell them the gospel. So I'll ask again, who in here has a story to tell? All right, we got some more hands. Keep them up, keep them up. Now, who has actually told their story? Keep your hands up. Who tells their story often? Who tells their story to people they don't know often? That's less hands than when we started, right? Look around. Those of you who had your hands up at the very end, keep your hands up. All right, take a look. Those of you who had your hands up when we started, put your hands up. There we go. A lot less hands than when we started. So what's the difference? What's the difference between the people whose hands were still whose hands were raised at the end and those whose hands went down as we went along? And let's expand that idea. We have people we look up to, all of us. Spiritual leaders in our life, spiritual mentors, leaders that many of us look at and think, I can never be like them. I can never do what they do. Or maybe we don't necessarily think we can't do what they do, but we have no idea how to get to that point from where we're at. Maybe it's Candace, maybe it's Aaron. Tim Bennett, Aaron Holt, names you guys might be familiar with. Johannes Omritzer. Peop, maybe these are people you look up to. Maybe it's another pastor or, or evangelist that's had an impact on your life. They're the type of people who lead others to Jesus. <clears throat> by the tens, by the hundreds, maybe the thousands or even tens of thousands. The type of person to walk up to a stranger in the street and tell them the gospel, lead them to Jesus. The type of person who is powerfully used by God and is clearly living out God's will for their life. What is the difference between these people and for many of us ourselves? 
after all. We have the same spirit. Don't we? Romans 8, 11 tells us the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. We've got the same spirit. We all have the same authority. Jesus says in John 14, 12 through 13, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. We have the same spirit as those we look up to. We have the same authority as those we look up to. So what's the difference? That's the question we'll be answering today. There are two differences that separate those with the I can never do what they do mindset or those that think that they could but they aren't sure how to get there from the those who are being powerfully used by God, telling the stories they have, living out his will, preaching the gospel, and winning souls for the kingdom. The first difference we're going to learn about comes from Romans 12, 2. If you're following along, just know I'm going to be flip-flopping back and forth between the NIV and NLT because I like how some of them were worded differently. So if you're following along, you're like, that doesn't make sense. Well, that, yeah, that's why. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is what we're going to break down in this verse. Because the first difference is this. People who are consistently being used powerfully by God, who are living out God's will and proclaiming the gospel, are continually renewing their souls. People who are consistently being used powerfully by God, who are living out God's will and proclaiming the gospel, are continually renewing their souls. Now, I recognize that that verse did not say soul said renewing your mind but let me explain i have three volunteers they know who they are they can come up now yeah you can come up this way i have prepared an elaborate illustration it involves three people and three pieces of paper i know all right you will be the soul you come and you stand in the middle wait, wait in front of me you will be the spirit. Okay, you want to be the body. All right, there you go. And then you are the spirit. And then you're over here. No, 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 don't stand next to each other. You stand on this side. You stand right here. There we go. It's all right, Autumn, you know. They, they probably want to see you more than me anyways, you know, whatever. <laughs> we as human beings are made up of three parts. We have our spirit. This is Finn. We have our soul. This is Autumn. And we have our body. This is Breezy is her name. All right. That's Ella <laughs> Putting the, making the sound guys work today. Oftentimes we confuse our souls and our spirit. Oftentimes we, com we confuse the soul and the spirit. We, enter we use them interchangeably, but they are two separate things. Now, our body or our flesh, Ella, our body or our flesh deals with the physical. All right, our five senses, what are they? Touch, feel, taste, see, hear. That is our body. Our bodies have been corrupted by sin. They are constantly desiring this, desiring that, craving this, craving that. But we are promised we will receive new resurrected bodies that are sinless when Christ comes back to reign on earth. But until then, we're stuck with our corrupted sinful flesh. Is what it is. We have our spirit this is the part of us that connects with God. Our spirit is dead by default because of our sin. 
But if we have come to saving faith, our spirit is resurrected by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit making his home within us. To put it more simply, as believers, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, which has brought our spirit back to life. And once it is brought back to life, it is perfect and desires what God desires. So we have our corrupted flesh, our bodies, our senses. We have our spirit indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Or if you're not a believer, your spirit's dead and you aren't able to connect with God. But when we have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit indwells us and we are made alive and our spirit desires what God desires. And then we have our soul. You're going to move around a little bit, I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> our soul deals with our mind, our intellect, our emotions, our will. Now our soul is pulled back and forth between our bodies <laughs> and our spirit. You can go back here. It's pulled constantly by the sinful urges of the flesh and the godly desires of the spirit. Back and forth. Just depends on the day for many of us, right? You know, some days, you know, some days I'm in church on a Sunday and I'm living in the spirit, buddy. All right. And then the next day I'm hanging out at the bar and I've had one too many drinks. And then it goes from there. And then our soul, our soul's over here hanging out with the body. All right? And that is how it is. As sinful, wait, go back over there. Because as sinful beings, our soul's natural inclination is towards our flesh. That's the natural thing. But if we continually renew our minds, start like scooching that way slowly. If we continue to renew our minds, then day after day, the inclinations of our soul begin to be pulled more and more to the godly desires of our spirit. And this is what we're made up of. Thank you, guys. You did fabulous. Can you give my volunteers a hand? That was fun. Good job, guys. So practically, what does it actually mean to renew our mind? How do we continually renew our souls? Because our souls deal with our mind, our emotions, our will. Let's go to Romans 8, 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. To renew our souls, we have to actively discipline our minds, our thoughts, our emotions, 2 Corinthians 10.5 tells us we are to capture every thought, the Bible says. Capture every thought. Every single one that enters our head, we are to capture it. And what does 2 Corinthians 10.5 say? It says to capture it and make it obedient to Christ. Make it obedient to Christ. Our thoughts... And emotions are not things that get to just happen to us. We are not powerless against our own mind. We are in control of our thoughts. We are in control of our emotions. What happens inside here doesn't have to influence what happens outside of it. Rarely should our thoughts and emotions impact our actions. We have to understand. I say this all the time. I know that the youth, they've heard it before. Not all of our thoughts are our thoughts. 
There is a very real enemy that we have to contend with. Satan, his demons. And even of the thoughts that are genuinely our own, many of them come from the flesh. These forces, both our flesh and the demonic realm, they both seek to gain influence over your mind, over your soul. Satan and his demons can and will plant thoughts inside your head that masquerade as our own. Lies that are destructive and twist and distort the word of God. Your flesh desires the sinful pleasures of this life and will continually direct your thoughts to the sinful and perverse, seeking to influence your actions. And if you are not careful to take these kinds of thoughts captive, they will in turn take captive your mind. The fleshly thoughts the demonic thoughts and wrong attitudes will come. That's life, man. Not every day am I feeling happy and jolly, you know? Some days crap happens and I'm feeling upset. And it's not wrong to feel upset, but sometimes I feel upset and I want to act out on it. And, and, and the person who made me upset feel my wrath, you know? But when that happens, we have to take captive our emotions, our thoughts, our souls. We have to examine them. Examine our thoughts. Are these from the spirit or are these from the flesh? And if they are of the flesh, we have to stop them, correct them, and set our mind instead on what the spirit desires, not what the flesh desires. So what does the spirit desire? We are told to set our mind on things of the spirit. What does it desire? Philippians 4, 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. To renew your soul, you must take captive all of your thoughts and fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable, and worthy of praise. But in order to fix our thoughts on these things, first we got to know what God considers true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable, and worthy of praise. It can't come from our own subjective opinions because they're flawed. So where do we go to learn, learn these things? Any guesses? Quiet. Ask the question again. So where do we go to learn these things? Scripture. Scripture. There we go. Yes. We go to the Word. The Word is the source of truth for all of us. It's what we stand on. It's what we put our hope and our faith in. It is truth. And in there, it explains everything that God considers lovely and worthy of praise. It's laid out in there. We just got to pick it up, read it. And learn what we are to focus our mind on. We must consume it daily. Meditate on it daily. Many of us are familiar with meditation, yes? But usually we're familiar with Easter meditation. Which teaches us to clear our mind. Clear your mind. <laughs> yeah. This is not a biblical way to meditate. 
just setting yourself up for disaster. Remember those enemies I was talking about that are seeking to control your mind? How easy is it for them to get in control of your mind if all you're doing is like empty it out and anything can just come in? Guess what's going to come in? Not what you want. No. The biblical way to meditate is to fill your mind. To fill your mind on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable, and worthy of praise. And as we continue to take our thoughts captive, as we continue to think on these things daily, our souls will be renewed. Our souls will be pulled closer and closer to the Spirit. And we will begin to be transformed further into the image of Jesus Christ. Our thoughts will change. Our attitudes will change. Our will changes. It changes to reflect the will of our Father in heaven as we do this. And not only just that, we are now, a, one, once we do this, once we renew our mind, what does it say? It says, then we will be able to discern God's will for our lives. And more easily hear his voice. This is the first difference, guys. People who God is using, people who are living out God's will for their lives, are continually renewing their souls. They take every single thought captive. They decide, is this of the flesh, is this of the demonic, or is this of the spirit? And then they make it. Think on Christ. They force it to reflect what they know is right, true, lovely, admirable. They are in their words daily, and they are absorbing it, allowing God's word to do what it does to transform our souls, to get our minds off of the things of this world. And that is what they do. Their minds are renewed. That's the first difference. But there's two differences. Now the second difference comes from Luke 9, 23 through 25. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed? This is Jesus speaking here. And he's telling his followers, though, well, those who want to be his followers, this includes us. If you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily and follow me. To understand the second difference between those used powerfully and those who wish that we were, we have to understand what God meant when he said, take up your cross daily. When Jesus spoke this, he was speaking to a first century Roman Jewish crowd, primarily. They had no preconceived notions of mercy, beauty, and sacrifice when speaking about a cross, like many of us do today. There was nothing good or pleasing in the imagery of a cross. It was a device used for capital punishment, the worst capital punishment that the Romans could possibly think, possibly drum up. Torture, prolonged torture that led to death. For us today, you know, ain't every day we go outside and we see someone hanging from a cross. We don't really have that imagery as, it's not as effective but for us contemporarily, think, think of an electric chair, all right? None of us wear an electric chair uh, around our necks. None of us, you know, tattoo it to our bodies and, you know, uh, and, and look at that and think of good things. No, it's for capital punishment. It's meant to kill you. Now, think of an electric chair and think of it instead of killing you in a matter of seconds, Think of an electric chair that has the ability to electrocute you throughout an entire day, all the while you're still conscious, feeling every single second of it, until you finally succumb hours later. How great of a thought is that? 
Not good. It's horrific. That's the imagery. That's the imagery that Jesus used. Imagine me telling all of you, in order for you guys to follow me, that electric chair that you just thought about, you have to sit in that every single day. Every single day. Or else you can't follow me. Yeah. How how you feel about that is probably not far from those who are in the crowd listening to Jesus right here. The torture, the severe suffering, and the death conveyed with that statement was not lost on them. And I'm sure it was confusing to have to endure that every single day or else we can't follow you. Say you'd want to follow Jesus anyway. Say anyone in this crowd, they're like, okay, you know, I'll take that. But following you is worth it. How am I to suffer and die every single day, God? I only got one life. Obviously, if any of this statement is meant to be literally true, not all of it can be taken that way. So what are you saying, Jesus? How do we follow you? How can anyone follow you if this is the standard for who is to be your follower? What are you saying? Well, let's look at some of the surrounding details of this statement. You must give up your own way. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. What Jesus is talking about here is this. Our body, our corrupted bodies, our sinful flesh. Not necessarily in the literal sense, although as we all know, there have been people who have given up their lives in the pursuit of Jesus. But not necessarily literal because it says every single day we are to crucify our fleshly desires. What Jesus is saying here is that in order to follow him every single day, we have to wake up, pick up our cross, and decide fleshly desires, no, not today. We have to wake up, we have to to decide today will not be about myself. Today will be about you, Jesus. Whatever my plans are, whatever I want to do today, no. No. My day is yours. Lead me. Let your will be done in and through me. Galatians 2.20 says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's what Jesus was saying. In order to follow me, you can't live. I have to live through you. This is a phrase, that there, there is a phrase that Christians often use to summarize this idea. It's die to yourself. Who in here has heard this phrase? Die to yourself. Well, now you've heard it. All of your hands should be up. It's up. Die to yourself. And Jesus says to do this, how often? Daily. Daily. The first difference involves our soul. Because remember, our spirit's good, dude. Our spirit desires God. Our spirit is perfect. The first difference between those that are used powerfully for Christ and those who wish that we were is that they have dealt with their soul. They continually renew it. The second difference involves our body. People who are consistently being used powerfully by God, who are living out God's will and proclaiming the gospel, are intentionally choosing to die to themselves every single day. They wake up, and they say, not me today, but you, Jesus, through me. People who are consistently being used powerfully by God 
who are living out God's will and proclaiming the gospel are intentionally choosing to die to themselves every single day. And it's not easy. It's not easy. Anyone who says it does, they're lying. It requires sacrifice. Take a second. Think about what you want out of this life. What are your goals? What are your dreams? What are you personally striving for day in and day out? And what is God's desire for your life? Can these things coincide? I'm not saying that they can't. For some people they can. For some people they can't. But can these things coincide? Is this something that you have thought through? Take Aaron, for example. Aaron Pringle. Is he in here? No. He'll be here in the second service, I'm sure. I can tell you what his hopes and dreams for his life weren't. It wasn't to be your guys' lead pastor. Before he was a pastor, he toured with a metal band. Rock and roll, bro, but like, you know, more angry rock and roll. <laughs> but not necessarily. They were out there preaching the gospel, you know, stuff like that. Even though the, the, the shirts often say, happy mu angry music for happy people. So he was out there torn with a metal band. He was signed to a record label, the whole thing. He stepped down once Telly was born. But it was never his intention to step down forever. He loved it. He wanted to be there for his children. He wanted to see his children grow up. And then he wanted to jump back into doing what he loved. Touring the world, playing music. But then God called him here to be our pastor. In order to do that, he had to sacrifice his dreams and the future he planned for himself. He tells the story of the time when him and Candace were in a car, and you know this realization came that this is what God is calling us to. And he says, and we wept. Because we knew that what we wanted out of this life, we had to sacrifice it. Because this is what God is calling us to. And that's, that's what suffering is. That's suffering, guys. The image of the cross, of dying, of suffering, it's real and it's expected of us when we are called to it. Every single day we're called to die. But not every single day we have to suffer. But those days come. And we have to remember in the midst of that that suffering is a privilege we have. Suffering is a privilege now that we trust in Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 9, no, 1, For you who have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Before we trusted in Christ, we were slaves to our flesh, to our body. We were bound. We were pulled by every sinful desire that overtook us. We sought after the things of this life, things that ultimately led us to eternal that would ultimately lead us to eternal death. And Christ died to set us free from that. Galatians 5:1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. put the NLT in there. See, I, even myself, I got myself confused. I put the wrong one in the computer. <laughs> Too many of us, after being set free by Jesus, seek out the burden of slavery once again. Just like the Israelites once they were freed from Egypt, if you guys know the story. We refuse to die to ourselves daily. We seek after what is familiar and comfortable and before we know it, our flesh is back in control. It's sneaky like that. And then we're bound once again. For me, it was video games. 
For those of you who know me, for any of those who know me for any amount of time, you know that I like video games, okay? I used to play them a lot, daily, for hours, and I enjoyed pretty much every single second of it. I've been playing video games since I was probably like five years old, so probably like 22 years of my life. And there's the denial of this isn't a problem, I can give it up whenever I want, guys. But I was either at church, I was at work, or I was playing video games. Those were the three places you could find me, consistently, always. And years ago, there was a time where God, uh, where God told me to give up video games. It's like, dude, give them up. And I couldn't see, I, I didn't really understand why, I just felt like that's what he told me to do. There was a nagging thing in the back of my head that's like, you know why, but I'm like, no. I can give them up if I need to. I just, this is what I like to do with my time. What else am I going to do with my time, right? You know, I got free time, might as well enjoy it, I'm going to play video games. But I still obeyed, I gave up my video games. But I didn't get rid of all the stuff for my video games, because I thought to myself, you know, maybe one day in the future, God will give me video games back. The thing that I kept could not be used without a system, I wasn't going to go buy a system, and I'm like, God, I'm going to keep this just in case you give it back, you know. And then I slept all the time to replace my time. <laughs> And God eventually gave me what I wanted. I looked back at the yoke of slavery that I wasn't to be bound by again. And I thought to myself, if only God would give me that back. I refused to learn how to live as a free person. And God gave me it back. And for years I've been playing video games since then, still. And then like a month ago, you know, we're sitting in a, we were sitting praying, and Aaron looks at me with his stupid smile. <laughs> and he's like, Isaiah, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you right now? Like, it just so happened that the Holy Spirit was really speaking to my soul and saying, you need to give up video games. But this time, not temporarily. I'm like, I looked at him, I'm like, you serious? You're going to do this right now? And he just starts laughing as if the Holy Spirit told him exactly. I, I don't, he, he, he just... He knew something was up. He knew something was up. And so I told him, and I've given up video games since then. And now I am having to learn how to live as a free person again. And it's hard. That's what I'm used to. It's comfortable. It's there, you know. Slavery is slavery to my flesh, to my desires, to sitting in front of a screen. That is what I'm used to. But now I have to learn to live. And why did God make me give this up? I believe God make me, made me give this up because I need to be out in the community more. I need to find somewhere to get involved in the community so that I can be around non-believers. I'm not around non-believers very often, guys. I have some friends every now and again that I get to go see, but I'm usually here. I'm at home playing video games. Oh, yeah. I was like, what's the third thing? Well, this is my work now. So, yeah, those things kind of merge into one. So I'm either here or I'm playing video games, and that's been my life for a long time. And now God's saying, no, go out into the community, get involved somewhere so that you can be around non-believers. Why? So that I can preach the gospel and do what God's called me to do. And I was talking about this with some of my teenagers. All right, we're going through, uh, they were playing some video games, and I was saying, I'm like, yeah, dude, I've been playing video games for years, but, but I have to give it up. And then it got to the conversation of hours spent playing video games. And these youth students that I have, they went into their Xboxes, and they started doing math. One of my youth students is 14 years old. He spent three and a fifth years of his life playing video games. At 14. The other one, he spent around a year and a half of his life playing video games. He's, he's older. I'm older than both of them. I've been playing video games longer than both of them have been alive. I don't know how many hours I've put into playing video games. Safe bet, you know, maybe five years of my life. Just sitting in front of the screen playing video games. It's been fun. But I got to an answer for those hours. You know? And I'm not saying that we don't get to have fun, guys. All right? I'm not saying every single hour of your day must be spent in the gospel. You are to, you know, 
put your, put your back to the plow and go, like, yeah, we're supposed to work, but we are supposed to be using our time wisely. There is time to relax, but for many of us, it's too much. For me, it was too much. For these youth students, it's too much, man. This, he's 14, he spent 3, 6, 9, 12, 30, that's about a fourth of his life. A little, a little, it's not quite that bad. Playing video games. And that's what slavery does. That's what slavery looks like. It keeps us distracted and it takes what we can't get back. Are you bound in slavery? Those of you here in this room. If we're honest with ourselves, most of us probably are. We live in a culture where it's almost impossible not to be. Everything in our culture is vying for our time. All the products we consume every single day are all competing with each other to suck up as much of your time as they can. Why? So that they can profit off you. Money's a great incentive. All of them, all the companies, all the names that you know that you probably have in your head, you know, they all compete against each other. They hire psychologists to try to make their product literally as, what's the word I'm thinking of? Literally as addicting as possible. How can we not be a slave? It's hard to not be. A lot of us, it's probably our phones, especially the teenagers. But I know that the adults are just as bad. And so I did some uncomfortable math for you. The average human lives 679,365 hours. The average human sleeps 226,465 hours in their life. That leaves 452,900 hours we have to work with our waking hours in our life. The average person spends four and a half hours on their phone. Some of you guys are like, that's, that's it? I'm like, yes, that's it, four and a half hours, you know? I'm sure, many, I'm sure many of us spend more. You know, we, we have the thing that pops up. Your average screen time this week. You guys know what your average screen time is. I know for many of you, you didn't get your phone until you were already an adult, as it was an upcoming technology. The younger ones in here, you've probably got a phone as a preteen. So I set a median to get just a rough idea. Let's say you get a phone at 18. At this point, you have 21,732 days remaining on average. Accounting for sleep, 347 hour, 347,721 hours left in your life. Accounting for the time on your phone, 21,732 times four and a half equals 97,794 hours you'll spend looking at your phone. At 18 years old, having a phone for the first time, you will spend over a quarter of your entire waking life just staring at your phone. To be precise, it's 28.12% of your entire life. <laughs> Slavery is uncomfortable when you put a number to it. It was uncomfortable for me just talking with the teens and knowing that I've been playing video games longer than they've been alive. No. I didn't have to spend all those times doing I could have been around people doing God's will for my life. Teaching them about Jesus. And I still would have had plenty of time to play video games, dang it. But now because I couldn't control myself, I had to give it all up. <laughs> we need to die to ourselves. We have to relearn what it means to live in freedom. We have to take the time we have more seriously. The gospel is a story that everyone needs to hear, but it's a story that not everyone will hear. Our time is quite literally running out. These are the differences. Continually renewing the soul. Dying to yourself. Living as a free person. 
All of you here have the ability to be used powerfully by God. You can live out God's will for your life. You can proclaim the gospel. You can see people's lives changed. But you will never be used the way God wants to use you if these two things don't become non-negotiable in your life. Renew your souls. Set Set your mind on the things above. Capture every thought. Don't let a second be taken by your flesh and the demonic telling you something that is a lie. Make it submit to Christ. Make your soul submit to Christ. Every day, wake up. Do what you have to do. Go to work. Set a little time aside to relax. But find a way to be around people who need Jesus. These are the differences, and now you know what it is. The people you look up to and think, I can never do that, you can. You just just gotta do these things. The people in here who are like, I wasn't sure how to get there. This is how you do it. Now you guys know, do something about it. You can bow your heads. God. Help us. Life ain't fair, you know? On one hand, we live in the most successful, rich country in the entire world, every single one of us practically, even the ones in here are hurting, 1% of the world. It's a blessing. But it also comes with some severe disadvantages, man. The society we live in is dead set on putting the burden of slavery on us once again that you died to free us from. Help us, Jesus to be intentional with our lives, to be intentional with my life, God. Forgive us. A lot of people in here need to repent, man. Jesus commands us to. I'm not saying you gotta come up here and start screaming out what you've done, man, but you got to. Because God's given us what we have. He's given us the time that we have allotted and people need to hear. God, help us to step up and live as free people once again. Help us to control our minds so that we can be used by you, so that we can know your will. I have two altar calls today regarding both of those differences. If there's people in here who who are having difficulty controlling your mind, your will, your emotions, and you need to renew your souls daily, I I would like to pray for you. If you are in here and your flesh is the problem, you're just a slave to your will, you're, you're a slave to your flesh's desires, doing this, doing that, running back to slavery, I would like to pray for you today. And then after that, if there's anyone in here who doesn't know Jesus, I'll get into that. <clears throat> Number one, the soul. For those in here who need prayer to renew your soul, to continually do this practice, if that is you, raise your hand. You need to spend time in the Word. You need to learn what to put your mind on. God, thank you for these hands. I pray that your Holy Spirit assists their, assists them in disciplining their soul. So that they can be transformed further into your image. So that their will can be your will, Jesus. I pray that you help them. In Jesus' name. And for those who 
need help dying to themselves every single day. You struggle with slavery. You're, you're pulled and you're bound by your flesh. If that is you, you can raise your hand. I'd like to pray for you. God, you see these hands too. Help them wake up every day and put themselves to death. The, the whims of this life, the things that we crave, things that we want to spend all of our time doing, God, help them to get the right perspective, to put that side, of, to put their flesh to death and live for you, to put themselves to death so that it can be you, Jesus, who lives through them, God. Help this church, help every single person whose hands was raised for both of them, live according to your will and be used powerfully for you, in Jesus' name. And now for those of you who don't know Jesus, the gospel is this. Jesus created us, created the world, everything around us. It was perfect. Humanity lived and walked with God in perfect relationship. But there is an enemy in this world named Satan, and he came and he deceived mankind, and they rebelled against God. God removed them from the garden, and the penalty of this sin, their rebellion called sin, is death, and death eternally. They would have, in order to pay for what they have done, they would have to eternally be separated from God forever. God was not willing for that to happen. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live as a man, to experience the sufferings of this life, but to overcome it, to live a perfect, sinless life, and he died on the cross. Why? To pay for that penalty that was, that was owed to you. <clears throat> that eternal penalty. God has paid for, Jesus has paid for. And the Bible says, if we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. <clears throat> what we owe God has been paid by Jesus. If any of you here are in this room do not know Jesus and you would like to make that confession, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you'd like to make that confession, I would like to lead you in that today. If you'll raise your hand. All right. You guys can bow your heads. You guys can repeat along with me. Jesus, I believe that you are Lord. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross to save me. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And be my King and my God. From this moment now until the day I return to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.